Hello and welcome to House Calls. I'm Vivek Murthy and I have the honor of serving as U.S. Surgeon General. I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Becky Kennedy, psychologist, author, and parent. We believe conversations can be healing. And today we'll be talking about parenting and exploring this question, how do we raise humans through connection, not consequences? I'm excited for you all to listen to this conversation with Dr. Becky Kennedy. Dr. Becky, as she is known, is a clinical psychologist, best-selling author, and mom of three. During the pandemic, she came to prominence when parents suddenly found themselves at home with their children and in desperate need of guidance. Dr. Becky is also the author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, Good Inside, A Guide to Becoming the Parent You Want to Be. And she hosts her podcast, Good Inside with Dr. Becky. She's been named the Millennial Parenting Whisperer by Time Magazine. As a parent of two young kids, I was curious to speak with Dr. Becky about so many parenting questions. Parenting is one of my greatest joys, but it's also one of the hardest things I've ever done. What I find fascinating as both a parent and as someone who cares deeply about social connection is how her approach really comes down to relationships. Ultimately, how do we see behavior as an expression of needs rather than a source of our identity? And how do we see the person behind the actions and opt for connection over correction? As you'll hear in our conversation, we go deep into what it means to parent and how we can see our kids more fully beyond their behaviors. We talk through real life scenarios like meltdowns and fights, and about why it matters to teach our kids how to embrace getting things wrong. In the last part of the conversation, we answer some questions from our online audience. And finally, we discuss how to talk to our kids about tough things happening in our world and in our lives. For me, this conversation was empowering. It gave me a better sense of how to approach challenges with our kids and an appreciation for how those challenges have something to teach us about ourselves as parents. I hope you enjoy this rich and hopeful conversation. As always, the team at House Calls is eager to hear from you. Please take a moment to rate and review the podcast and send us your ideas for episodes at housecalls at hhs.gov. Dr. Becky, thank you so much for joining House Calls. I'm so excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I must confess, when I was reading uh, what you've written and watching some of the videos that you've put out there, I was partly looking at it, you know, you know, as Surgeon General preparing for this wonderful conversation we're about to have, but really I was looking at it as a parent myself, you know, of a four and six year old who had all these questions that I was looking for answers to. Uh, and your work has just been incredibly illuminating uh, and it was helpful to me and I know it's been helpful to so many parents out there. So first, I just want to say a thank you, not just for this conversation, but for everything you've been doing over the last few years for parents. Well, uh thank you for saying that. That's such an honor to hear from you. And yeah, these ideas really, like they light me up inside. They help me become a better parent. I always say I like talking about regulation, resilience, all these things, not because I'm an expert in them, because I'm trying to build them in myself and in my kids. So the fact that now I have a platform to just kind of do my personal work and meet other people, you know, that's a win-win for me too. Oh, well, that's very humble of you to say, but mm -hmm. you know, I know that this last couple of years in particular has just been such a tough time for parents and it wasn't like parenting was a walk in the park before COVID came along. Uh, but I think the added stresses of the pandemic and having to deal with uncertainty and with stressors in your own life as a parent and trying to figure out how to manage your children and still, you know, look out for the the signs that you need to see, look out for and not miss important things. This has just been, I think, tough for so many parents. And I'm curious, you know, in your, if you, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about how you uh, started walking down this path of becoming, you know, such an important source of information for parents. Uh, Cause I know this was a recent uh, transition for you as well. Yeah. So uh... I've had a long standing private practice. And in that practice, I generally did work with adults in intensive psychotherapy. So, mm -hmm. adults who came in with a variety of struggles. But to me, there's always a common theme, even though no one says this explicitly, which is the things I learned earliest and wired early on into my body to adapt to my childhood environment um, were put in place to protect me. But now, uh, you know, really work more against me than for me. And that's why I have things that we call symptoms. And yet 
even though I know I'm stuck and I know I want to change, I'm having trouble living my adult life in the way that feels best to me. You know, can you help? And so I love working with adults in that context. And then as I became a parent myself, I realized, you know, it wasn't the child therapy that I personally enjoyed doing the most as much as the work with the parents um, so that they could shift even small things in their family home where their child was living the majority of their hours rather than in my therapy office. And so I then quickly started working with parents side by side to the therapy I was doing with adults. So it would be like a parent coaching appointment, therapy appointment, parent coaching appointment. And one of the things struck me, I was like, wow, the way I was taught to work with parents is at complete odds with the work I think is, you know, effective with adults in psychotherapy. Mm -hmm. Like the principles are different. The things I'm saying to parents to do with their kids, I would never say the equivalent, you know, to an adult. And it just kind of struck me in a session. I was trained in timeouts. I was trained in mm. sticker charts and all that stuff really lit up at least the left part of my brain, you know, logic and linearity. And there really was a session literally in my New York City office where I said to this, this these parents, I was like, I'm sorry, I don't believe anything I'm telling you right now. Wow. <laughs> I was like, what? <laughs> and I was like, I know I'm telling you how to do a timeout and your kid's hitting. And prior uh -huh. to right now, like everything made sense, but something just kicked in. And I was like, wait, this this can't be the way. And I was like, I don't know really what to tell you instead, but like I kind of feel like this really isn't it. And and then, you know, I offered them a refund. They 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 were like, you know, very overwhelmed. They're like, what are we supposed to do? I was like, I don't know. Maybe come back to my office in a few weeks. Um, and they, to their credit, never came back because it was a very bizarre session. Um, <laughs> but I really then went to my computer and I said, well, what do I know about adults? What do I know about wiring? What do I know about attachment and internal family systems and the body and experience and regulation? And what if I took everything that I know helps adults rewire, that I know changes the course of an adult's life and kind of reverse engineered that to parents so we could wire kids early on with patterns and processes that would actually not only help then, but actually help for the rest of their life instead of set them up to have to rewire like all of us are doing. And that's really what led to all the ideas that are now in Good Inside. Well, gosh, I, there's so much I want to ask you about. I'll tell you that one of the places I want to start, just an insight that you you frame I think very clearly and eloquently is that behavior is not about identity, but that it's an expression of need. And I found that very powerful when I, I read that. I mean, speaking of, for example, the timeouts that you've talked about and sticker charts and other things, these are all things that you know, we have tried with our kids, you know, from time to time. And I will just take timeouts for a moment. Um, they've never felt good, you know, for me as like a parent to, to institute for my child and um, for so many reasons that I can go through. But when, when I remember reading that line, that behavior is not identity, it's an expression of need, that, that really spoke to me uh, because, you know, I think so many times it feels like we're trying to control and shape the behaviors as our primary outcome. Uh, where is there something deeper happening inside? And as a parent, I find myself struggling to understand what is that? Like, what does my child need? Is this timeout actually doing anything for them? Uh, or is my raising my my voice actually registering to them? Or is it just increasing fear uh, that they have inside them and contributing to their insecurity? Um, so I wonder if you could just spend a moment, though, to talking about that, that really is sort of what I found to be a critical principle there about behavior as an expression of need. Yeah. And everything you're saying resonates with me so much. That's what happened in this session. I was like, wait, I know there's all this data and, and it's real data about timeouts and this and evidence based. And literally I had this, this moment. I was like, well, I'm going to cry. I'm like, what about the data in my body? That's like, this is so wrong. Like I, mm. I, if my husband ever gave me a timeout when I was, you know, struggling with him or took away my iPad or gave me mm. stickers, I was like, as humans that just Right. Like we laugh. We're like, oh my goodness. Like my relationship with my partner would not be in a good place if that's mm. what my partner was doing to me. So that's, you know, I, I appreciate scientific data so much. I'm a huge lover of science and evidence. I just think um, humans are complicated and we need to be critical of the evidence we consume, be a little skeptical. So yeah, in terms of behavior as a sign of what we need, not as a sign of who we are, which is a huge, you know, huge difference. You know, take the example of, you said you have a four and a six-year-old, so mm -hmm. they're playing, you know, with, I don't know, they're building something with blocks, and your four-year-old has, you know, the set of blocks your six-year-old wants, and they grab it, or they mm -hmm. hit them, right? Yep, happened so, yesterday. Yep. There you go. Yeah, this <laughs> stuff happens in my house, too. Exactly. Because um, we have 
humans as kids, right? They, they act all types of ways. And mm-hmm. so if I look at that as a sign of who my kid is, and I think this is our natural inclination, probably because in our worst moments, our parents looked at us as kind of who we were in the behavior rather than what we needed. So it's just kind of, again, wired into us. I'd say something like this, like, or I'd think, what's wrong with you? Like, is my, and then we go really far. We're like, is my kid a sociopath? Like, are they going to be in jail forever? You know, and what kind of person hits their brother and brothers are supposed to love each other. Sisters are supposed to love each other. Mm. And then I might give a timeout because what's happening in the moment is my whole perspective has narrowed. Like my son became the hit. The hit became my son and I mm. want to have no more hitting. So I collapse that behavior into the identity. I punish my child because of this behavior. And, you know, that's kind of, in, at least for then, the end of that. But there's a, there's a lot of problems here. Number one, I really do believe that as humans, we are all doing the best we can with the resources we have available in that moment. And I think mm. there's just an evolutionary truth to that. Like as animals, we don't, we don't work against ourselves. So what would be going on for a six-year-old if they were doing the best they could where that resulted in a hit? Well, then if I do something I call the most generous interpretation, right? And I think this is a muscle we have to build for ourselves, for our partners, definitely for our kids. What's the most generous interpretation of that behavior? It's actually a shorthand to separate behavior from identity. I might say, well, sharing blocks is like, it's kind of hard. Or, whoa, those are the blocks my older kid got for their birthday. And now their younger sibling, they came in and saw them using them. I guess if I saw my friend, you know, I don't know, um, reading the book I was in the middle of reading, I'd probably be pretty annoyed too and be like, hey, you took my book. Or, you know, it's hard to manage frustration. It's hard to manage anger. The problem isn't that my kid is angry or the problem isn't that my kid is frustrated. The problem, and here goes back to need, is they don't yet have the skills to manage frustration. And so I always think there's like a simple equation in order to manage a feeling, our skills have to be greater than the feeling. And kids mm-hmm. are born with all the feelings and none of the skills. So for the first many, many years of their life, just developmentally, they have the feelings. Their skills are way behind. And then when we send our kids away, like this is what I always found interesting about timeouts. Like what's my six-year-old doing in their room? to build frustration tolerance skills so that the next time their brother does something, they're not just hitting. Like, I don't know about you, but my kid or my kid is not Googling like how to take a deep breath when frustrated and teaching themselves that skill while they were sent away. They just feel ashamed. They just Mm -hmm. feel like a bad kid. They just feel threat because in an attachment system, distance, right, means Mm -hmm. uh, less safety. And so actually all that does is fear and threat and feeling like a bad kid. All it does is actually only increase the likelihood that my child's going to engage in that exact same behavior down the road. Now, if instead in that moment, I'm like, whoa, 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 right, this is a sign of what my kid needs. This is kind of what they struggle with. I think there's like almost always when our kids act out a two-step process we take. Number one is we have to contain the emotional fire. And I think this is something parents need to, to need to like, first of all, just be taught. Like we're not taught anything. It's like when your kid is hitting, you're not doing much to make a lot of progress. You're just containing the behavior. If you had a fire in your house, you're not fireproofing your house during the fire. Yeah, you got a fireproof, but not during the fire. During the fire, you just have to contain the fire. And then, so I might step in and say, I'm not going to let you hit your brother. It looks like your brother has toys you want. I get it. It's frustrating. I'm going to sit in between you. There's another way to let him know. We're going to get through this together. Something like that. So I'm setting a boundary. I'm containing the hitting so it doesn't keep happening. But then at night, this is the key thing. I think I'd want to think this. Okay. If behavior is a sign of what a kid needs, what would my kid need if that situation came up again to not hit. And I guess I think, wow, they, they'd probably have to know what to do when they're feeling frustrated. They probably have to know what to do when they want something and don't have it in their own hands. Right. And I think this is where we can get really I don't know, honest with ourselves and be like, I don't know how, how good are any of us at controlling our emotions when we want something that someone else has. It's just hard. So then maybe I'd sit with my son the next day and say, I'm going to play a game with you. It's a weird, weird game. We don't usually play. I'm going to have your favorite blocks. And I want you to come into the room. And it's so annoying, right? When someone has your favorite blocks, it's so annoying. And I want you to take a deep breath and I want you to step away from my body, like all the way toward the wall. You know why? Because if you step away from someone when you're mad at them, you're not going to hit them. 
If you step mm. toward them, you might hit them, right? So let's practice this. And parents will be like, is my kid really going to do it? They really will because kids like feeling masterful. They like learning things. They like feeling like good kids who need to learn, not bad kids who need to get sent away. Mm. And that goes back to that need. They, they need my help. They're struggling with this emotion. And the answer isn't to send them away or add shame or add punishment or even to not have the emotion. We all have all the emotions. The answer is to learn skills to manage those emotions. And as parents, we're actually the person who has to really teach them those skills. This is really powerful. I like that two-stage uh, process that you talked about and taking the time when the situation isn't, isn't acute and things aren't blowing up to actually practice uh, techniques with them that can help bring some calm to them or help them manage a difficult situation later. And you know, one thing you're saying that also I think really hits home to me is Sometimes as parents, we're trying to help our kids develop skills that we ourselves may not really have. Uh, and I think in that way, I mean, I've certainly in the last six years found parenting to be not just revealing about kids, but revealing about myself and particularly about the gaps that I have uh, and and sort of the my, my own sort of shortcomings, if you will. I'm curious, like you, one of the things you, you have really laid out is that this process of parenting is not only a process of self-discovery for us as parents, but a chance for us to also think about our own lives, our own skills, our own connection. And I was wondering if you could say a little bit about that for parents out there who are worrying that they may not have what it takes uh, to be able to get the, give their kids the skills and tools they need. Yeah. So I have so much to say about that. And I think it's my favorite thing about this approach is parents always tell me, they're like, I have grown more than my kids through this good inside approach and not from a place of what's wrong with me, but from a place of, oh, I can feel so much more empowered in almost every area of my life. That's like a cool opportunity. So, yeah, so let's say, as an example, um, you're you're very triggered by kids whining, which most people, of course, don't like whining. Nobody is like a fan of whining, right? But let's say you're very triggered by it. You know, you're like, yeah, when my kid whines, I just, like, I say the things I, I told myself I never say. I, I just, I scream. My tolerance is zero. And then just to start by reminding yourself, the answer isn't, okay, Dr. Becky, so you're telling me I'm going to get a place where I like whining? No, but there's a lot between liking and being triggered, right? And so much of our own childhood, they play out in the moments we're triggered with our kids. And that's that's in some ways a hard truth. I actually think it's an empowering truth because when we realize some of it is our own circuitry, to me, it doesn't mean it's our fault. It means we actually have an opportunity to change because- I don't know about you. I don't want to depend on my five-year-old changing for me to change. That just feels like a very <laughs> powerless bet, you know? Yep. Um, I'm like, I'm not going to put faith in, you know, my five-year-old to change the direction of my life. Like, I, I think I'd bet on myself first. So my kid comes out. They're like, oh, chicken for dinner. I don't like chicken, you know, or can you, can you get me water? I'm so thirsty, right? That like, oh, oh that like horrible sound as parents, right? So if we take a moment to reflect on, okay. There's something about whining, probably even beyond the sound, that really evokes like a shutdown, almost there's a danger in my house response. Because the only reason I'd say, what is wrong with you? Or you're so annoying. Or go to your room if you're talking to me like that, is because I, my body in some ways thinks there's a threat, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the only reason it would do that. And so then if I reflect a step further, connecting our childhoods to our kids. And I say, okay, well, there must be something whining represents to me, right? And I think whining represents like total helplessness, right? Because mm -hmm. I know that's when I whine too. I still remember when my favorite coffee place was shut down and I thought it was still open and I needed coffee and I was just like a whining puddle, you know, <laughs> outside because I felt so helpless and I wanted something badly. So then if I ask myself, okay, well, what did I learn in my house growing up about when I felt really vulnerable and really helpless? Did I grow up in a family that would have recognized that? Did I grow up in a family of, oh, I'll give you something to cry about or pull up your bootstraps or there's nothing to be upset about? Because if I did, then I had to almost learn in my own body, whoa, like feeling helpless and feeling powerless and expressing that um, is just really not safe. Hmm. And so now I see it in my kids. And here's, here's I think, the really crazy thing is like we think we respond to our kids I don't think we're responding to our kids or they're whining. We're responding to the lessons we've learned about what our kids' behavior represents. Hmm. And that predated our kids' existence, right? Right. Um, and so then if I, I'm like, okay, well, how do I turn that? I always ask myself, how do I turn an idea into action? Because I, I like to be very practical. And I'd say, okay, well, I wonder what would happen in the next week if I 
almost like embraced my own helplessness in situations a little bit more. Just a little bit to kind of close the gap between what my body thinks about helplessness and whether it's safe and then how it ends up acting that out on my kid. Mm -hmm. And so I would, like if someone was in my practice, I'd be like, I want you, and let's say this person had a partner. I want you to go. And instead of saying, um, you never come home from work and you don't even help with the kids at night, I'd want you to say something a little bit more, yeah, in need of help. Like, I feel really overwhelmed at night. I feel really overwhelmed. And I know I've criticized you for not coming home. The truth is, uh, I think I could say it more effectively. I really need your help at bath time. Hmm. I really, really do. And I would bet a lot of money that the way you end up responding to your kids whining, which is a symbol of their helplessness, is actually going to be a lot less intense because you almost embraced a little part of that quality in yourself during that week. You know, I know for me, like my oldest, who's 11, like he's always speaking up for himself. Like, and I know that sounds good, but it, it can be annoying, right? It's like, but why can't I have a sleepover? Why? I want to have a sleepover. My friends have a sleepover. And why can't I stay up later? And why can't I have more screen down? Blah, blah, blah. Right? It's like always. And it it can be triggering to me. And when I reflect on myself, I was such a people-pleasing kid. Like I was, you know, I looked at the world, like who do I need to be to make everyone else happy? And what do people want of me much more than what might I want for myself? Mm. And it struck me a couple of years ago that like I was always very triggered by this. And again, it's not about liking it, but I want to say to my son in that situation, hey, I answered you. You're not having a sleepover. If you want to keep asking, write it down on a piece of paper. <laughs> you know, I, that's okay. But I wouldn't say that. I'd end up saying to him, like, what is wrong with you? Why can't you make my life easy? Like, take no for an answer one time. And I just felt bad, like you said. Like, you just feel bad as a human. You're like, I didn't like the way I showed up. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm going to take on an experiment this week. And I was like, <laughs> it was, you know, like a number of years ago. But I remember I was, like, pregnant with my third child. And I was like, you know what? If someone doesn't give me a seat on the subway, I'm going to ask them to get up. That's a way instead of being like, oh, I'm just going to take what people give me. I'm going to like ask for myself. And there was a time at a grocery store where I wanted to return something that had like gone bad. And the manager was like, no, we don't have the receipt. And I was, you know, I made the argument for like, hey, like one second, I'm a customer here all the time. And I had this couple of days where I really like stood up for myself a little yeah. more. And it was amazing how with my son, it wasn't obviously a one-to-one -one conversion, but I did find myself just able to interact from a more grounded perspective. Because I wasn't kind of like acting out my own childhood patterns, like on him. <laughs> uh, that is really interesting. Okay. And, it, you know, building what you're saying right now, it, it's sort of clear that your connection to yourself and your connection to your child, that cultivating that is, is really critical to being able to be effective at, you know, shaping behavior, shaping resilience. And that's one of the things I really liked about your writing is you focus a lot on the power of connection and how fundamental that is uh, to, to parenting. Yes. I was wondering if you can talk about this concept of connection capital uh, that you write about, which I found to be really interesting. Yeah. So going back to this other model of parenting that we are both speaking of, that we've all tried or has even been given to us, I think, is like the truth. Like when your kid does this, you give it time out, time out. And if you're working on talking, you know, more kindly to your sibling, every time they do it, you put up a star. And after three stars, they get this, you know, I don't know, whatever they get, some prize. Um, every time we interact with our kids that way, we look at our kids as their latest behavior. Hmm. And I think most of us at every age, I'm going to probably say all of us, we actually feel most connected to people when they see like us as a whole person rather than our latest behavior, right? So if I were to have some big reaction to my husband, let's say he said, oh, you forgot to get toilet paper today. You said you were going to get it. Seemingly innocuous. But we all know if I had a bad day and my yeah. husband said that to me, like, I'm not going to say, oh, you're right, I forgot. I'm going to say, like, you're so hard on me. Or why don't you get the toilet paper for once? I'm just going to be reactive. And if uh -huh. he looks at me and my behavior, he'd be like, go to your room, right? If, if that's what we say to our kids, right? Go to your room. Or you don't get TV tonight. Mm -hmm. And if he took a deep breath and said, Becky, whoa, like, that way that you just reacted to me was, like, not okay. And also, you must have had a really bad day to have that reaction. And maybe we can each cool down and just, like, I could hear about that because that seems really important. He's connecting then to the person under that behavior, right? Mm -hmm. And so how does this relate to our kids? Well, definitely in the moment, I'm a big fan of, yes, setting a firm boundary, which again goes to like, I won't let you hit, something like that. 
But always, 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 I think we can connect to our kids. And there's multiple benefits of connecting to our kids. Number one, it just actually feels right. Like it feels good to see your good kid under their struggle. And also connection is key to helping kids feel safe, right? Kids Mm -hmm. are oriented by attachment. They need to connect with their parents, their caregivers, their sturdy adults to navigate the world. So every time we add disconnection, we actually add to their threat system, which only makes them more reactive, which makes them more likely to do all the behaviors we're trying to get them not to engage in in the first place. And I like this idea of connection capital because, again, I'm, I'm a visual person. I, I, I love metaphors as a way of understanding, you know, human behavior and these complicated things. And every time I think we ask our kids to do something they don't want to do. My image is like we draw down on the connection bank account, right? Because right? And we have to do this all the time as parents, right? Put your shoes on, come to the table, time for dinner. Can you clear your plate? Can you, you know, you know, clean up your room? Like these are all things we ask our kids to do that they don't inherently want to do. And so if we're pretty big on drawing down on the connection bank account, I always think, well, we better be even, you know, better at depositing into right. that account. And connection in all types of moments is really how we deposit it. So one way is connecting to your kid when they're struggling, right, and being present, right? That doesn't mean allowing the behavior. That means stopping the behavior and connecting to the kid underneath. Another way is just proactively, when times are calmer, connecting to our kid. And I think a big way to do that is playing with our kids without our phones around. It's, like, actually Mm -hmm. that simple, right? Um, Saying, hey, I know I've been distracted. You know, I know my phone's off and around. I'm going to put my phone in the other room. I only have five minutes. I know it's probably not going to feel like enough time, but it's better than nothing. You pick the activity and I'm just, I'm here. I'll play any role. You know, I'll play that game you want to play, whatever you want to do. And just giving them our full attention is a way of connecting to them. Naming what they're doing before we make a request is a really powerful way of connecting to them before we draw down on that. So instead of saying, hey, come on, it's time to take a bath, saying, oh, you look like you're really into that drawing. Oh, tell me a little bit about it. Oh, that's interesting. How do you think to do that? Oh, ooh, it is time to take that bath, sweetie. We can pick up the drawing again in the morning. Like, I promise the likelihood of your kid going to take a bath is so much higher, right? Just like it would be for us. Like, if I was sitting on the couch and enjoying a book and my husband was like, we got to go to dinner, I'd be like, oh, what? And he said, ooh, you're you're really enjoying the book. Tell me about it. Huh, you know, we do have to leave for dinner. I'd be like, okay, you see me as a person. Now I'm more likely to get up and do something, you know, you want to be on time for. So I think there's all types of ways as parents we can think, how can I deposit into that account? How can I show up? How can I put my phone away for a few minutes? How can I be present? How can I notice what my kid is interested in? And even in like 10 seconds of doing that, it really builds this bridge between you and your kid. And if you think about that, even the visual of now the bridge is a lot stronger, now they're going to be much more likely when I ask them to essentially walk over the bridge from their side to my side to do something that's a priority in my life, right? Like, hey, we got to get to bed now. Um, They're going to be much more likely because of the way I've kind of built the bridge in their direction before that. Yeah, this resonates so deeply, what you're saying, because I do think that not just kids, but even adults, so many of us are are starved for human connection, you know, and even if we experience it in some moments of our life, we may not feel it in all moments. And it really affects us as beings who are made to be connected to one another. And what I think is really powerful about the example you shared, for example, if if you were reading a book on the couch, for example, and somebody, your husband said, hey, it's time for dinner right now, uh, versus if he paused and said, hey, it sounds like you're really interested in that book. To me, that's like such a, you know, short but powerful moment where, you know, he is helping to reflect a need uh, that you have, uh, as opposed to just telling you um, what he needs you to do in that moment. And um, I think the, the point about time is really important. The fact that it doesn't have to take a lot of time to be able to pause and to reflect the need or interest that somebody is expressing in that moment. Like you were saying earlier, the, the need behind the behavior, if you will, uh, and that just changes people's attitude. Now, unless you say there's something I often, they've said over the years that I, I feel like in my own experience, just meeting folks from around the world and working with uh, people from different cultural backgrounds and such, regardless of where people come from, I find that people all have a f- like at least three common needs. Like they all want to be seen and understood for who they are. They all want to know that they matter 
and they all want to be loved. And we all need those three critical elements in our life. But I think one of the things you're helping really underscore is that our kids need that too. Uh, and being able to take even a few seconds, like you said, 10 seconds to reflect that can go a really long way uh, to helping build a solid connection and communicate effectively with them. Yeah, I think that's exactly right. And again, I think that we've just been given this model of child development that's all about, okay, when my kid does X bad behavior, mm. do Y thing. Yeah. And it it misses the person. And we connect to a person. Like there's a person who's struggling under mm. every, quote, bad behavior. And I do feel like we've been given like this raw deal as parents. You know, you are you have a baby. You're like maybe told how to buckle them into a car seat. And then you were like, go do it, you know. And you're like, why would I know how to do this? And the kind of most prolific, you know, kind of literature, at least I can, I think in America about kids is all about behavior shaping mm -hmm. and behavior shaping and behavior modification misses all of those needs you just met. Yeah. Right. And yeah. then it just perpetuates the cycle where then kids just act out more because they're looking to be seen. They're looking for attention, not attention seeking, but like, yeah, connection seeking, which is what humans need from an evolutionary perspective. And then those behaviors are just seen as, quote, more bad behaviors. They get more punishment. And we're just like in this horrible cycle where nobody feels good. That's right. And I think in, you know, thinking about parents, I think what's so tough for parents out there right now is a lot of them were raised with a very different way of parenting, right, themselves. And on top of that, they're dealing with extraordinary stressors uh, right now, which sometimes make it hard to just pause, you know, and reflect, uh, you know, on what you're doing. Uh, and and I think it can be incredibly lonely uh, to try to figure this out on your own as a parent. Um, I, gosh, can remember countless late nights spent like searching on the internet at 3 a.m. when our kids were going through some crisis or another trying to figure out what to do. And it's just, it can be really tough and, and really lonely uh, as a parent, which is why I think what you've done in helping to build a community uh, of parents who can uh, talk through these types of issues and work on them and learn from one another uh, is so incredibly valuable. Well, thank you. And when we built our membership platform, you know, internally, they're all of the group of us building it, we're all parents. And, you know, we're like, we know what parents need. Like, how does this not exist? You know, you hmm. need trusted information, right? Uh, where, you know, you have a question, you going to Google just doesn't feel good. You're getting some like SEO optimized article, you know, that's not even yeah. meant to help you, but <laughs> you're meant to like, I don't know, sell an advertisement. That's not that useful. And I think, you know, when you started this podcast, you said, you know, maybe you had questions for me more professionally. And some part of you also was like, well, I'm also a dad, you know, and like, okay, maybe we could use this to answer some of my questions. I have found the most incredible thing on, on our platform where there's members from within, within a week of launching, we were in every continent, but Antarctica, right. Huh. Which I don't think we'll ever, I, I, I don't know if we'll ever get there. Right. So six continents feels pretty good. Um, over 30 countries. And what's amazing to me is there, there were all the differences and the global differences and cultural differences and socioeconomic differences racial differences, like one parent's struggle, when you really look deep down, it, like it always ends up being everyone's struggle. Like mm. oh, it's, there's something so global. And so many people tell me in the community section of the membership, wow, like this is the opposite of social media. Like just reading these posts and saying, wow, like you find that hard and your kid's doing this and your kid is hitting and your kid is growling when they're upset. I thought, I, I thought something was wrong with my kid and I have trouble staying calm and I tell myself what I want to do as a parent, um, but it doesn't always happen. Like there's such healing, which means mm -hmm. we're in a safer place to actually do the learning from community and realizing, wow. Like this thing we're doing every day, parenting, right? It's it's the hardest job that we do in an unending way as soon as we start it. Like it's it's just a really hard job. And and there are things we can do and there's resources we can get. And this is what I think the membership does. But I want to be honest, like I think we can make things that feel impossible feel hard, but we can't make things that are hard feel easy. It's just like mm -hmm. nothing about our membership makes parenting easy, but yeah. it makes it hard instead of impossible. And hard is like much more preferable when you have especially a community go it through than impossible. Yeah, no, that's so true. And and I think as human beings, we we can sustain so much challenge and face down such tough odds 
when we're together, when we feel like there are people who have our back and when we have support. But when you're alone, gosh, even what seem like everyday challenges can feel utterly overwhelming. There, there's something actually that you had um, written that I remember I noted down in my copious pages of notes uh, that I took when I was going through your materials. But and this really stuck with me because you were, I think, talking about kids here, but I feel like this so is so true for adults. You said, happiness requires safety and safety requires not being overwhelmed and frightened by the feelings inside, which is why it's so important for us to learn how to regulate our emotions. And that's the key to resilience. Um, and that just really st stuck with me because I, I certainly want that for my kids. You know, I want them, I know that despite being the overprotective father that I'm certainly guilty of being, that I can't protect them from all adversity, right? And I don't want to. I want them, in fact, to be able to face adversity, but with, uh, you know, the uh, tools to, to manage the difficult feelings that may come up, to, to, you know, deal with frustration when it may come up and fear when it may arise. Um, but I find often that you, with adults that many, many of us are also trying to build those skills too, because we may not have uh, gain them to the full extent that we wanted early in life. But but I just found that to be such a powerful lens through which to look at it, that happiness requires safety and safety requires not being overwhelmed by emotions, which requires emotional regulation. Yeah. And I think so many different ideas come together with this one, right? Where I think a common refrain, you know, is like, don't you just want your kids to be happy? Or don't you want your kids, you know, don't you mm -hmm. just want your kids to be happy? And I remember someone in my private practice years ago saying this, Dr. Becky, don't you just want your kids to be happy? <laughs> I remember being like, no. And then something interesting happened. She was like, you want them to be unhappy? And I was like, well, this is something we do as humans. We say mm -hmm. like, I don't want one bucket. And then we assume it has to be the polar opposite bucket. No, of course, I'm not wishing unhappiness on my three children. But the more we focus in the early years on, quote, making our kids happy, the more we limit their ability to tolerate the entire range of emotions that they will have for the rest of their lives. Because I never had an adult in my private practice come and say, my parents were so amazing that they figured out by the time I was an adult how I would never feel frustration or jealousy or sadness. I've never felt those feelings because my parents got rid of them, right? Like that's never happened as an adult. We feel all the feelings. Like we feel jealous and we feel frustrated and we feel sad and we feel left out and we feel less than. And I would argue that the stakes are higher because now we're adults and like we're responsible for a lot of areas of our life. And so either by the time our kids become adults, they've developed coping skills for the range of emotions that will inevitably come up in adulthood. Hmm. Or they kind of feel just as raw and unprepared for those emotions as they did when they were two, right? So let's take a four-year-old doing a puzzle, right? Which is a good example of like the intergenerational work and resilience work. So inevitably a four-year-old's doing a puzzle and guess what? Puzzles are inherently really hard. They require so much, right? They require frustration tolerance. They require a lot of flexibility of like, wait, I'm going to put this piece down because it seems not to be working and try something new. That's so hard to huh. do, right? But if I look at this from a resilience building perspective versus a happiness perspective, I'm going to do something very different. If I prioritize happiness for my four-year-old, I'd say, put that piece down and here, let me just, let's do this piece and this piece. And okay, you know, we avoided the tantrum and, you know, now we're done with the puzzle. But if we go back to this idea of circuitry and what's in us and our kids, probably what's really happening, I would argue, is I see my kids start to get frustrated and my body feels frustrated or uncomfortable mm. watching them get frustrated. And then I do the puzzle for them, not really to help them, just so I can go back to feeling safe and calm myself as a parent because I don't want to cope with the tantrum that might happen. Mm -hmm. But let's fast forward to, I don't know, my kid's 25. My guess is my 25-year-old kid's probably not doing puzzles as like a, for a living at least, uh, you know, but God bless them if they are. Um, and they're at some job. I don't know. And they're looking at their computer. I'm like, actually, I've never thought about this. There's some puzzle in front of them. Probably not literally, but like they have to figure something out. And what does their body know about that moment where they get to, oh, I don't know what to do next, or oh, this isn't working, mm -hmm. right? This is a direct connection from their relationship with puzzles at age four, right? Because their body scans themselves and says, okay, do I know how to cope with this feeling, or am I just looking for the quickest, quickest exit to this feeling? And probably at age 25, they can't go to their boss and say like, hey, can you just do it for me? Or if they did, it probably wouldn't work out that well, right? But if that's what they've learned from a parent, like someone else is just going to step in and make this all go away. 
mm-hmm. then that's not going to be incredibly adaptive at age 25. But if going back to the puzzle as a parent, if I can say to myself, wait, Becky, this is a good moment with my kid. It's not going to be pleasant. It's not going to be enjoyable. But this is like long-term helpful. Like if I can even tolerate my kid's frustration without fixing it for them for like 30 extra seconds, I'm actually buying myself 30 seconds, probably more when they're older, Hmm. of sitting in front of a computer and say, whoa, 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 I can work with this. Let me take a deep breath. And that's like, that's hugely beneficial. So what would that look like early on? I might say, oh, you know what? Maybe put that piece down. Puzzles are so tricky. I don't know about you, but I'm just going to take a deep breath and tell myself, ooh, this is hard and I can do hard things. Mm. This is hard and I can do hard things. And even if my kid has a meltdown, they're absorbing the way I responded to their frustration. That gets absorbed directly next to their own frustration. And let's say, of course, this isn't one time, but this is, you know, the next time they do a puzzle or the next time they're trying to draw a flower or open Play-Doh or whatever they're trying to do that's hard. If my kid senses that I can tolerate their frustration, then that's the foundation for them to be able to tolerate their frustration. And then that's Mm. the foundation for being a 25-year-old who can tolerate their own frustration. Oh, wow. That's very rich right there. So like, because I think what you're pointing to is the the power of modeling the behavior right there in the moment for your child, as opposed to directing your child on on what to do, which I I think is such a, it's such a nice twist, I, I think, on, on how to approach that moment of frustration with your child. Um, That's great. I love that. I love that. Yeah. You know, going back to the happiness and resilience thing, Mm -hmm. I often picture feelings, like all the different feelings we have in like a jar, and they're all there, right? And then the only reason feelings take up more and more space in the jar and kind of push other feelings to the bottom is because those feelings don't have like a cushion around them. They don't have a way of getting managed. And so they Mm. take up more and more space. And so if we picture this from our kids' early years into adulthood, like what I hope for my kids is that, and and not to say I'm like perfect at this, it's a hope, it's not something I'm perfectly executing, let me be clear, is that frustration and jealousy and being sad, like by the time my kids become 18 and older, that they've developed kind of various cushions for those feelings. And so those feelings don't take up the whole feelings jar. You know, they feel frustrated and they say, okay, I'm allowed to feel frustrated. This doesn't mean I'm stupid. This doesn't mean I'm not going to figure it out. Something I say to my kids a lot, frustration's on the pathway to success. It means you're on the pathway. Like you're on it. Like keep walking, you know? And then the irony about happiness is the more of our feelings kind of have coping skills. Then you could picture that feelings jar as they get older, the more space there is for our kids to feel happy. Because they won't be, happiness won't be crowded out by frustration or by sadness. It actually has more space to emerge. And so I think there's this big paradox that the more early on we focus on allowing the range of feelings, that doesn't mean allowing our kids to hit. If my kids started hitting Mm me while doing a puzzle, I wouldn't be saying, oh, amazing, embrace the frustration. No way. I'd say, like, I'm not going to let you hit me. Um, You seem to be having a hard time. We're going to get through this together, right? Something like that. But that actually allows for the emergence of happiness later on because mm-hmm. my kids have developed really strong coping skills. Yes. Oh, that is great. Well, you know, one of the things we did, Dr. Becky, in anticipation of this conversation is we asked folks online if they had questions for you. And I wanted to dip into a few of those audience questions uh, right now. So one of them is about meltdowns. The person asks, what's the best response to meltdowns in public? Just leave them, let them cry loudly and shush them. What should I do? So uh, I think the best response to a meltdown in public is probably in line what's going to help a meltdown in private, right? Mm -hmm. So often in public, we just struggle with our kind of vulnerability to what we think other people are thinking about us, Mm -hmm. right? So I'll, I'll give my favorite strategy for there. So I think an overall question that we need an answer to as a parent is what is my job when my kid and then fill in the blank, okay? And if we can't answer that question for ourselves, we obviously won't be able to do a, quote, good job. Because to do a good job, you have to know what your job is, right? What is my job during a meltdown? And I actually have an answer to this question of what I think. I think a parent's job is to keep their body calm and Hmm. keep their kids safe. Now, if you hear what's not involved there is ending the meltdown. And safe can mean a lot of things. It can mean physically safe and emotionally safe. So here's an example. You're at a birthday party and your six-year-old comes to the 
pizza and cupcake portion of the birthday party. That's the birthday parties I have generally had pizza and cupcakes. And they want to sit next to their friend who's the birthday girl and the seats are taken by that girl's cousin or something, mm-hmm. whatever the seats are taken. And your kid just, oh, I want to sit next to, you know, Annabelle and whatever the meltdown is. It's like horrible meltdown. Mm-hmm. Okay. Step one, remembering I'm going to do my job, whether I'm in private or public. But I think the little tweak I'll give as an answer for public is we assume other people are thinking like the worst thoughts about us. Oh, Becky's such a bad parent. How are her, could her kid be having a meltdown? She's awful. Her kid's awful. I always think if I'm going to make up the thoughts of other people, because we do make them up, we never hear them. We just make them up and respond accordingly. If I'm going to make up what other people are thinking about me, I might as well make it work for me, period. Mm. <laughs> so when I'm in public, I picture other parents saying to me all the time, Becky, you do your thing. Oh, Becky, I've been there too. Becky, Mm. this is not a barometer of your parenting or your kid. All kids struggle and you just do the thing that you think is right. I actually picture this and it's so helpful, right? So I think that's step one for everyone to like really try that out. It's really empowering to picture yourself having a cheerleading squad instead of like a firing squad, essentially, Uh which is what it feels like. So that's step one. Step two, okay, what's my job? Keep my body calm and my kid safe, okay? So... First step is going to help you keep your body calm because if you picture everyone cheering you on, you're not going to feel as awful as a parent. But I also tell myself often during any meltdown, nothing's wrong with me. Nothing's wrong with my kid. I can Mm. cope with this. Hugely, Mm. hugely helpful. And then if I'm keeping my kids safe, obviously if my kid's like starting to hit people, I use that I won't let you. I'm not going to let you hit. But in public, there's often this other element. Like I do think for my six-year-old, having everyone in the class witness their like out of control behavior. I know for me, if I was in a situation, it would just add more fuel to my shame. It would make me even more dysregulated. And so in that situation, I probably am going to carry my kid away. But this is key and our kids feel the difference, not because I'm embarrassed about my kid. I'm going to carry them away because I need to protect them because like they oh. feel so out of control and they just need containment. Mm-hmm. Right. And and I think every adult here, if you were at a party with friends and you were just going around saying awful things to everyone mm-hmm. and, and things that you wouldn't actually say if you weren't as I, I hate you and you're awful and F you, you know, if you did have someone who's like, Becky, I'm just going to carry you away. Like, like, because like you are going to thank me later for helping mm-hmm. you. Right. That's right. And so I pick up my kid and this is key. And I'd say something in this sturdy voice. Oh, like you're having a hard time. I'm picking you up and um, I'm carrying you the car. I'm carrying you to the other room. You're not in trouble. I'm going to stay with you. We're going to get through this together. Because mm. again, that's a way of keeping my kids safe. I'm staying calm. And then I go somewhere where I can wait out the meltdown. And that's what you do with meltdowns. They're, they're emotional fires. And we don't have fire extinguishers in this metaphor. And we wouldn't want them. Because again, the problem isn't the frustration. We don't want to extinguish frustration. The problem is that my kid has not yet learned to cope with the frustration. And this way of containing them is a really important first step. Got it. I love that. That is great. So let me get to one other question here. Yeah. And this is actually a question that I have, uh, you know, as well, which is what do we do when our kids are scared about being wrong? So... For example, they won't answer a question or they won't participate in class or they won't like exactly, would, exactly. Yeah. And uh, my like, I'll give you an example of my, of my own Perfect. son who, when he listens to this in a few years, if he does, is probably going to hate me. But just to say that, you know, he, he's very smart, and in, I know a lot of times he'll know the answer to questions, but unless he's sure that he has it right, he's scared to answer. And that's yeah. true in school. It's often true at home and other people are around. And it's even sometimes true, even just when it's me and my wife, Alice, uh, you know, asking him a question. Yeah. Like, like he loves math, for example, but if he does an answer, if he's not hundred percent sure of the answer, then he's reluctant to say it. And so we're trying to figure out how do we tell him that it's okay to make mistakes. We learn from our mistakes. So, Hey, we're wrong too, you know, all the time. Um, totally. but, but what advice do you have? So I have a couple, a couple ideas about this. And this is one uh-huh. of my favorite topics actually. Um, and, you know, one of the things I think about big picture is that kids who have a lot of like early quote success, and I say quote, meaning like the way that like probably our society defines it, they, you know, they're early readers, they, uh, you know, do well on tests, they make the soccer team. I know this might sound odd, but those are the kids I I worry about. If I had to worry about a bucket of kids long term mm-hmm. for their confidence and resilience, way more. Then I worry about the kids who are like average readers or like getting things wrong in class. Because Mm -hmm. going back to our original point, and I don't know if you thought about it this way with your son, this is a good example of where behavior collapses into identity. 
but mm. from a quote positive way. If um if my identity is defined as the person who is quote smart, but smart is defined by getting things right, then yeah. anytime I'm in a situation where I might not get something right, it's actually an identity crisis. No wonder I don't want to answer because like we don't like to have our identity in question. Our identity is how we feel safe. So the work then is right. How can I actually help my son separate getting anything right? from feeling like a good, worthy, smart person, Hmm. right? Because that's another example where those two things have collapsed into each other. So I have a couple ideas. After this podcast, I'm going to send you my confidence workshop because I think it's going to blow your mind and it's going to give you so many ideas about like, wow, that looks at confidence in a totally different way and gives me so many ways to interview with my son. But before that, a couple things. So one of the things I think about, especially when – there's high performing parents. And I would argue you're like a pretty high performing human being. I think everyone would just agree with that. So there's that. It doesn't always feel that way, but okay. (laughs) It doesn't. It's true. (laughs) (laughs) It also doesn't define you. You, you know, you're a person um, who has many accomplishments. You're not your accomplishments, but we, even without all that, I always think like our kids are flooded by our capability. So as much as we say to our kids, I get things wrong too. Here's my kids like first couple hours of the day. It's like they, they're trying to put their clothes on. They're trying to tie their shoes and they see us go like, right? Mm. Just figure it out. We cook food. We toast food. We never spill when we get the milk. We can reach things. We can, we are saying, oh, here's what that word means. And here's some math thing. Like we just do it because it is easy for us. But kids, especially kids who are high performing and start to a little bit wrap their identity around that, they notice in their environment, like, wow, look at my parents who figured everything out. And way more effective than telling kids I make mistakes is modeling struggling with something every single day. And it might seem like you have to act it out a little bit. And sometimes we do, but I've never heard kids call out their parents on this. So when my kids are in that pre-reading stage, when I know they have their letter sounds and they're just like, I know they're going to kind of start to put it together soon. I'm extra mindful when I read them books to just like mess up a couple words. I mean like, Oh Oh. oh my God, that was like way too fast. Well, let me go back. Sorry. One second. I never turn to them after and say, by the way, when you read, it's okay to make mistakes because it just takes away the magic of the moment. Like just like, just trust that the experience matters. Right. But like, imagine if you, I don't know about you, but like, I'm not a great cook. I'm not. And if I was like, I want to really learn how to cook. And there was some professional chef around me all the time who, like, always did everything right and never burned the garlic and, like, mm. never mess something up. And then they were like, oh, you go try. I'd be like, yeah, yeah. Like, I don't know about that, you know. <laughs> but if I was watching myself around someone, be like, oh, I burned the garlic. I got too hot. Okay, whoa, whoa. I can salvage this. I can figure it out. Good chefs mess up garlic. If I just witnessed that, mm. like, that would massively impact my mentality when I went to saute broccoli with garlic for the first time, as an example, right? So uh-huh. I would say, if you have a kid like this, step one is just start to model mistakes and let the experience speak for itself and do something I call realistic regulation. So maybe you're tying your shoe and like you actually mess it up. Don't then say, oh, actually, I know how to do it. You just do this and this. Oh, figured it out. Because that's not a kid's way of learning. Mm-hmm. Like struggle with it a little bit. So I think that's number one. Number two is something that I like to call doing a 180 on perfectionism, which has helped my daughter so much. So it might be saying to your son, hey, you know what? We're going to do, you know, maybe you're doing some math homework or whatever. You're doing something mathy in your house and say, I have a really weird thing to tell you. Okay. Do you know that a kid's job, like their job is to learn? That's Mm. one of their jobs. And do you know that when we get things right, Like, our body kind of celebrates, like, oh, that felt good. But do you know that we don't learn anything? We literally learn nothing when you get something right. You Mm. learn nothing. And we're a family that really loves to learn. And your job is to learn. And so, like, here's the thing. Like, I'm going to give you some math questions. And I I need you to do your job. And every time you do your job, which is going to look like at first not getting it right, this is going to be so weird. I'm going to give you a high five. And every time huh. you get it right, I'm just going to be like, oh, that was fine. But like your brain didn't really grow. So I don't know. I'm going to have to tell your teacher you didn't like really learn and that's your job. You know? So like there's a way to kind of add some playfulness. Uh-huh. And in a way, what you're saying to your child is you can develop good feelings about yourself in a different way than the box you had limited yourself to. Uh-huh. So now we're going to have as in a family a way to like embrace getting things wrong 
And kids who really like to, who are very high performing, they they look for markers of success, right? They kind of know what they're supposed to do. Your sons look to get something right. And so what you're really also doing is giving a different way to look for a marker, right? And to even name that is like, wow, you just learned something new. You just learned that, like, sometimes we need multiple steps. Sometimes we have to slow down. That's amazing. That's going to help you so much in life. And then you're really kind of emphasizing the process of learning Hmm. instead of the product of getting something right. Yeah. How do you think he would respond to that? I think you'd respond really well. In fact, I'm going to try it out tonight uh, when I get home and and when I see him, in fact, I'll try it with both my kids. But I think you're right because I think he, and this, I feel like I identify with this because I felt this way as a child as well, um, that I was also scared to get things wrong and I felt like I'd built an identity you know, around myself as somebody who knows how to do certain things well. And so getting something wrong was not just about feeling bad about getting that question wrong. It was actually a threat to my identity, right? And so, and that felt much more existential than the question in front of me. So um, I like this approach uh, that you're talking about. And I'll say, I know our time is drawing to a close, but I want to sneak one last question in here that I've been thinking about and that we hear from other folks all the time, especially in this moment. You know, as you and I are talking today, there are big and tough things happening in the world, right? There's a massive conflict in Ukraine that's happening. We are still in the midst of a of a pandemic. There are hurricanes and floods and droughts and wildfires all over the country that are plastered all over the news. And so young people are reading about this and hearing about it, uh, you know, each and every day. And it's raised the question of how do we have conversations with our kids about bad things that are happening in the world? Uh, I love the one of the sort of principles that you have laid out is tell the truth. Uh, you know, when it comes to how we talk to our kids about life, big things, small things. In particular, in this moment, when a lot of parents are trying to figure out how do I talk to my kids about the tough things that are happening, whether it's the things we described or gun violence that happens in their communities or uh, other difficult things in life. Um, yeah. How do you suggest we approach this as parents? So the way I'd start is the way I try to start answering any questions. Let's let's have a framework to understand before we intervene. And I promise Mm -hmm. you that pause is worth it because then instead of saying, how do I talk to my kid about Ukraine or about gun violence, we have a framework and we can just then apply that framework anytime something uncomfortable happens, which is really efficient rather than solving every single problem that's different when it arises. And I think the biggest principle that I think about with kids is that information doesn't scare kids nearly as much as being alone in the absence of information, scares kids. So Mm. going back to evolution and attachment, kids are helpless, right? Our kids are helpless for so many years. It's like amazing our animal species survive, (laughs) right? Because they need us for so long. And so because they're helpless in their early years, two, six, you know, 10, they're looking around in their environment, always saying like, what's changed? What's new? What do I notice? And they notice way more than we do. We know that kids perceive even more than adults because their survival depends on it. And then The question is only, do I have an adult who comes and is present with me and explains Mm. things to me with everything I've picked up on but don't yet understand? Or do I pick up on everything and I don't understand it and no one talks to me about it? And so I just have this kind of free-floating confusion and anxiety, right, all over my body. And I think we know this as adults. If you're in a workplace and you hear rumblings of, I don't know, layoffs or we're moving or the CEO is changing, okay. Think about how that feels versus if you hear that. And then someone even tells you the worst thing that you could hear. Hey, we are going to have a round of layoffs and we will tell you next Tuesday. And at least you have a system, right? Kids need a system. So what I would say to parents is, first of all, remember that. Your kids are probably perceiving more than you think. They're probably picking up on when we say funeral, death, cancer, funeral, death, cancer, or Ukraine, Bomb, Russia. They're like, I don't usually hear the word Russia and Ukraine. Why am I hearing it over and over mm-hmm. when my parents look worried and scared? Like, so then the choice is, do I want to leave my kids alone with all of those perceptions or do I want to talk to them? And I, you know, very much recommend the latter over the former. And then it's about coming up with words that are more real words than they are euphemisms. Euphemisms always get us in trouble with kids because they just add a layer of confusion, right? Mm-hmm. Saying to a kid, You know, our great aunt, whatever her name is, you know, went to sleep for a long time is much scarier to a kid than hearing, you know, she died of cancer. Dying means when our body stops working. 
cancer is a type of sickness that's different than the types of sickness we've seen in our family. No one gets cancer from being around other people who have cancer. And cancer is, you know, whatever we might fill in the blank with, depending on the type of cancer it is. Like, we end up not saying cancer because we think that helps our kids. But saying cancer actually helps our kids understand that when their dad later says, hey, I'm, I'm going to stay home from work, I'm sick, that they don't think their dad's about to die because they use the same word as we use with someone who did die and never came back to the holidays, right? So yes. I think that's the framework that matters. Our kids probably perceive something. We don't want to leave them alone with it. and talking to them with real language matters. I also think this general intro helps to say, no matter what the topic is, hey, I want to talk to you about something that we're probably all going to have some big feelings about that that might be hard to talk about. And one of the things you can know about this family is we can talk about hard things together. And you can know when hard things happen, I'm going to be honest with you, because I know we can get through them when we talk honestly to each other. Hmm. And so it's a little bit of like a preparation. And there's something really powerful as a parent of like hearing yourself talk your values. It's like, right, I'm doing something that I believe in. Right. Um, and it'll give you the confidence, I think, to take the next step. That's such good advice. And I love that framework for how to think about talking about tough things, whether they're something happening in your family or something that's happening around the world. You know, Dr. Becky, I want to thank you so much for this conversation. There are so many wonderful principles that you laid out here. And I know that of the many things I'm taking away from this conversation is just uh, a sense of hopefulness about the fact that there are frameworks and tools that can help us with these tough parenting challenges, a sense of empowerment as well, uh, because with those tools and strategies comes a, you know, ways to approach some of the challenges I think a lot of us have been grappling with. Uh, but also, I think the, the fact that you're helping build a community uh, of parents who have each other, uh, you know, during these times, I can feel really lonely, I think is absolutely invaluable. So I'm so grateful to you for this conversation, for everything that you've been doing uh, to help parents all across the world. I appreciate you. Well, thank you for your service, for everything you've done. Um, and this was such an honor to connect and look forward to connecting, hopefully, another time soon. Thanks for joining this conversation with Dr. Becky Kennedy. Please join me for the next episode of House Calls with Dr. Vivek Murthy. Wishing you all health and happiness.